due to copyright reasons, we can't use any of the music we wanted to. So today, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about Gojira! Minus one. Glicks, what is going on? We are receiving a signal from a new area on the planet Geekery. All right, let's see what the planet has for us today. Opening forms in three, two, one. Hello, devoted geeks, and welcome to Comptalk Podcast Extension of Geek Devotions, the show from devoted geeks who are devoted and know your loved. I'm Dallas. I'm so glad you guys have hit the play button today. Today, ladies and gentlemen, I am joined for episode 174 uh, by my beautiful bride, Celeste. Hello. How are you, babe? I'm good. Glad to have you here today. Yeah. As we uh, we talk about something um, important, mm-hmm. groundbreaking, shaking life-changing the ground was shaking godzilla minus one has come out Mm -hmm. and so we're going to be talking about that today and uh, i'm excited because we're going to talk about it and then in the second half of the show we're going to do spoilers but with the spoilers we're going to have some audio from some friends of ours who saw it also yeah so i am i'm this is going to be fun yeah it's gonna be a fun time so uh, before we get into that, uh, we want to remind you guys we are in the middle of a of our theme of mythical mayhem. Yeah. What is mythical mayhem, Celeste? Mythical mayhem. We are focusing on mythology all month long and retellings of different mythologies. So far, we've done Magnus Chase and the Asgardians. Mm-hmm. Um, you did just generally about Oni. Yeah, I was I was trying to pin down what specifically you did i remember some of your your devotion but i couldn't mm-hmm. remember what it was based off of yeah, yeah uh so you talked about japanese oni mm-hmm. so w- we have a couple of the bottom shelves coming out that will also fit into this yeah category so it's it's interesting conversation piece for the season mm-hmm. so it's been fun we're gonna have a guest uh, article on the website i'm excited about that i am too I am like, I am, for those who don't know, uh, we have a great friend, David Gardner, who he has a podcast, fantastic podcast called the Enthusiast Podcast. Yeah. And um, it is a, it's very much like Geek Devotions, Mm -hmm. but it's purely podcast form. Uh, It's funny because when he first came out, uh, his podcast was called Devoted Geek Devotionals. Yeah. And people thought it was us. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like, like they thought it was an extension of geek devotions and then we're getting messages about, Hey, you know, you guys started a new thing. We're like, no. no. And, uh, got connected with David. Fantastic individual. G- really great. great. What I love about him. Is he's, he's got a great spirit about him. Oh a yeah. Very humble gentleman. Uh, he's funny to talk to. Um, and, but he's very, very intelligent mm-hmm. and very gracious. And, and he, he took it upon himself. I won't, I won't put this out there. We did not contact say, hey, you can't do that. He did it himself because he realized the brand confusion. Yeah. And changed it to the Enthusiast Society. Yeah. And it's uh, Art of the Enthusiast podcast. And he has a group called the Enthusiast mm-hmm. Society. Uh, so, but he's doing a guest article talking about uh, how understanding certain Greek mythologies actually helps you understand certain moments that take place in scriptures. Yeah, which I'm very excited about because he puts a lot of thought oh yeah into all of his podcasts Mm -hmm. like you can tell he's he's thought this out he's worked things out Mm -hmm. and uh so just to be able to have some of that on our our page i'm excited oh yeah again we we love david he's a great guy and i appreciate how thoughtful he is to everything Mm -hmm. to every one of his episodes he relied great thought to it and again just he he exemplifies a lot of what we like to be about here at devotion which is the kindness, the gentleness of the gospel and um, to a community of people who need that. Yeah. And so we appreciate David and we're super excited to have him writing an article for our website. So, um, and we have another article that I have to find. I, I realized it the other day we got really busy and somebody submitted an article for our website uh-huh. and I feel incredibly, incredibly uh, was really terrible. <laughs> for not getting it done oh no yes so i'm working on getting that out the door by the end of next week also so a lot of content coming your way a lot of content and so that's taking place so that being said um let's get into our conversation yeah uh we were talking about um godzilla minus one mm-hmm. 
we got to see it what was supposed to be the last day mm. of it mm-hmm. being in theaters stateside it was only supposed to be in theaters seven days and it like people were so blown away by it that it is now being picked up for extra days mm-hmm. and um so this has been a smash hit and if you haven't watched it uh we're gonna do spoiler free yeah. and then i'm then back in the break we're gonna spoil everything but this is the IMD, IMDb description of it. It says this. Post-war Japan is at its lowest point when a new crisis emerges in the form of a giant monster baptized in the horrific power of the atomic bomb. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's, that's what this was. And boy, howdy. Ooh. Was this was this a, a party? So let's, let's let's do our spoiler free. What are your thoughts that are spoiler free on it? Go see it. Okay. Well, we're done for the show. Uh, <laughs> also, we need to own it. We will. We will definitely own it. I need to own it like yesterday. Right. Um, it's definitely one that I will rewatch mm-hmm. a lot. Like it's going to go on to the the list of of ones that i will rewatch. we've talked before about shin godzilla and how much we love that one Mm -hmm. and that one because it focuses so much on the political side of things right is not one that i i would rewatch often Mm -hmm. we've we've watched it a couple times but it's not one that i'm like yeah i'm just gonna put this in yeah while i'm doing other stuff Mm -hmm. uh this one because it's more character based Mm -hmm. instead of plot based right um, it, it's more of a, something I would put on to, to watch and just enjoy because it, it delves into some deeper topics, mm. but you can definitely just go in and watch it at face value. Oh yeah. Definitely. Like Shin Godzilla was great, but you could not, you would not enjoy it as much if you didn't really understand some of the stuff that's going on yeah i think that you could understand certain things about it and again we're not talking about necessarily shooting guys right now no. we have a whole podcast episode about on our up uh, if you guys want to but what made it interesting for me was the director worked on um evangelion and so mm-hmm. the shots and everything it was very anime based and so it was just a very beautiful thing to watch it and, and they did some creative things with the property mm-hmm. as a whole this one um it felt more like the original Godzilla. Yeah, but with modern day storytelling. Yeah, uh, I mean, in fact, there were scenes in it that were basically from Gojira, and I'm mm-hmm. saying Gojira, uh, separate from Godzilla on purpose. And that's yeah. if you look up the movies, there's there's a distinction between Gojira, which mm-hmm. is the original go- movie, and then Godzilla King of the Monsters. Yeah, which was the American cut because it was it was cut. There were things spliced in. It's very different feel. Um, <clears throat> and I say that because in Gojira, there was a somberness. Mm-hmm. There was a, 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 a heaviness to it. And Godzilla Minus One felt like a return to that in a yeah. lot of ways. There was a somberness. There was a, and maybe that's the wrong word, but there was this heaviness to the mm-hmm. storytelling and to the feel of it that you felt the devastation that I feel like you missed out in other other versions of Godzilla. Yeah. Like even like there's a lot of devastation took place in the legendary Godzilla series, oh, which yeah. is for, for those who you're not familiar with the lingo, the legendary Godzilla was the, the American ones that we did starting in like 2014 uh, with um, the dude from breaking bad. Yeah. Um, um, and uh, what's his name? Watanabe. I don't know. Oh, okay. He was a guy from uh, the, the creator movie. Oh, oh, and The oh. guy was like, let them fight. Um. Ah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, that guy. That guy. But that's, the, that's what we call the Legendary Series because it's in the middle of Legendary Pictures put it out and yeah. they're creating what's called the Monsterverse with it. As much devastation as there were, there wasn't, there was a little more levity to it. Absolutely. Whereas this, this, this was a serious film. This was a, we're, we're walking you through a lot. Yeah. And I appreciated that about this film was the heaviness of it. And again, it had a feel through it. And there were a lot of different elements throughout the entirety of the movie that link back or they, they're kind of nods to previous Godzilla films mm-hmm. throughout time. 
I want to say that one of the characters had the same name as a main character in Gojira. Yeah, you know, I thought the same thing. I can't remember which one it was, but um, I know which one it was, but I I don't want to yeah. say it. I was um, I was listening to Monster Island Film Bolt. Yeah, which is uh, a a podcast specifically about giant monsters and kaiju, and it's hosted by our friend Nathan Marchin. If you're if you guys are hardcore into Godzilla and, and giant monster movies, kaiju's, you need to go listen to his podcast mm-hmm. because he doesn't he does an absolutely amazing job breaking the stuff down and discussing stuff. Uh, but he brought in a guy. Um, it, the moniker that he has is, is the G-Man. Mm-hmm. And um, the I, I, I'm, I've seen the G-Man in various spaces. Because, mm-hmm. um, again, people associate me with Godzilla because that one time we did a thing. And I do. I enjoy Godzilla a lot. Yeah. I hear me. Mm-hmm. I am not an expert in Godzilla. Mm-mm. I am not on the level of Nathan Marchand and the G-Man. These dudes... They are, they know more than I have forgotten, or I have forgotten more, they have forgotten more than I know yeah. about Godzilla. That was the way that worked out. That was terrible. For trying to, I don't know what you so were trying to say. I have a lot of respect for these guys. And the G-Man, he's one of those guys, he's super deep into it, and very intelligent gentleman too. But um, they were talking about how there were a couple characters, and there were a question, couple characters. Oh. They were wondering if they were supposed to be callbacks to um, original ones. Yeah, I believe it because mm-hmm. Japan is the master of the Easter eggs, <laughs> if that makes sense. Like you watch any anime mm-hmm. and there's going to be callbacks to other things, mm-hmm. animes of a similar genre, things happening in culture. Like it's just it's going to be a thing. Oh, yeah. People put stuff in there all the time. So I would believe that they they did that yeah. on purpose. Absolutely. Uh, which by the way, I do want to tell you guys, if you guys want a deep dive, we're not doing a deep dive. We're just doing a casual conversation about it. But um, Nathan's episode was like three hours long. They do like a shot for shot conversation about it. It's really fascinating to listen to. Mm-hmm. And it's funny. Um, and so uh, go check that out. But um, but yeah, so this movie, we we mentioned it was, it was kind of a, it had a, a, a heaviness to it. Mm-hmm. Um, which you had said that was, you know, the the other one, the one Shin Godzilla, it also had a, a slight heaviness to it also. It was more of a analytical heaviness mm-hmm. where this was just a heavy story. Yeah. This one felt more personal. Yeah. Whereas Shin felt more national, yeah. which is weird. Like it was more about the people and the and the government and the lack of ability of the government mm-hmm. and people dealing with that. Where this was the people pulling together mm-hmm. because of certain things that took place that we'll talk about in the second half of the movie yeah. of this conversation. Well, and it also followed one person throughout a time period of their life. Mm-hmm. And even when Godzilla was not around, like there was legitimately several years told in the movie mm-hmm. and, and it was not anything to do with godzilla it was just life Mm -hmm. well that's again that's this that's classic godzilla storytelling Mm, though where you have the human plot line running alongside the godzilla plot line and they intersect at some point yeah so what are are there any other aspects about the movie that you liked that you can do without doing spoilers it was beautiful Mm. the cinematography was fantastic with Mm -hmm. it there were several shots that because with with this type of movie you want to have the the moment of oh my gosh Mm -hmm. he's so big right and you had that a couple times just the way they did things Mm -hmm. um i love the the way they did godzilla Mm. like it it felt more like a suit than cgi Mm -hmm. but it was definitely cgi it was, was yeah, it? Yeah, it was definitely CGI, but it felt like the suit at the same time. It it felt realistic. Mm-hmm. Like there's a a sheen to the legendary monsters mm-hmm. that makes you go, "This is a movie, right?" This Godzilla, I could see him popping up. Yeah, like he looked real. Mm-hmm. 
So I, I appreciate that. I thought it was practical effects, <laughs> especially in some scenes like where his head was out of the water. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's not too bad of a spoiler. No, I think there was a picture of it somewhere. And he, he's like, <laughs> like, I'm like that. It looked like there was a practical effect going yeah, on. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that for sure. They did a great job, like where there was a lot of practical stuff, and then they used the CG sparingly, and like it, it look, it felt like a suit. It looked like a suit, which I think that was the genius of it, because mm -hmm. it helped to create that feeling of the original Godzilla. Yeah, while it's still being done in a modern way, and that's what I genuinely enjoyed about it. Like you're to, like, this isn't real, but this feels good. I have to wonder if they had a a a um a model mm. that they were basing the cgi off oh, i'm of. sure i'm sure they like did. that they they were like okay this is what it would look like here this is what it would look like here let's do the cgi with yeah. this definitely definitely i feel like anything else we're gonna say is gonna be a spoiler yeah so we're gonna go into a a small break and we'll come back This podcast is a proud member of Culture Box. Whether you enjoy geeky reviews, comedy, or original fiction, you can open up the Culture Box and find something excellent for your soul. Point your web browser to culturebox.media. Under new management. Honestly, Jimmy, I don't think Cameron Winter is much of an upgrade from the board. Of course, but a villain is a villain is a villain. Oh, well, he's taken a hands-off approach with us, but keeping the board in line. I can't complain there. <laughs> I'm glad you're writing my copy and not a mind-altered Corone. All right, like I said when we launched this show, let's get this promo started. <clears throat> Hello, Kaiju Lover! It's your favorite film curator and host, Nate Marchand, here to tell you that in 2022, the Monster Island Film Vault is seeking entertainment and enlightenment through tokusatsu made in America. If you thought it couldn't get any bigger than The Conquest, The Year of Gamera, or me getting shot into space, Season 3 will be Amerikaiju. Yes, we're moving from franchises to my home country. I've selected over a dozen of the best, and most infamous, giant monster films to come out of the US of A for this series, starting with 1925's The Lost World, going all the way to present day with 2018's Rampage. We'll park in the 1950s with drive-in classics like The Giant Claw, and even hang out with some superheroes with Power Rangers 2017. But the history of American Kaiju wouldn't be complete without drifting with tourists about the modern classic Pacific Rim. All the while, Godzilla Redux and Patreon-sponsored episodes will continue. Get that last slot while you can. I think you have me confused with our new boss. Anyway, I'll be bringing back favorite guests like John LeMay and the Omniviewer and introducing you to new tourists like Alex McCumbers and Alyssa Goji Geek. As usual, episodes will drop the second and fourth Wednesdays of every month, with the first episode being a full-length film discussion with the tourists centered around the main theme, and the second being part of the ongoing sub-themes. But whenever there's an extra Wednesday in a month, you'll get a special fifth Wednesday bonus episode that could be a mini-analysis, a quick review, an interview, who knows? These cards are wilder than a drunk WHG3! Yeah, I said it. So join me, my intrepid producer, Jimmy from NASA, and the rest of the crazy crew here at the KIJU studio on beautiful Ogasawara for a harrowing history lesson on the strangest of American films starting next week on January 12th, 2022. America! Oh, where's Jet Jaguar when I need him as a dump button?
All right, and we are back. We do want to encourage you guys to not just check out Culture Box, but check out our friend uh, Nathan Marchant over at Monster Island uh, Film Vault. We're, we're throwing, he's not part of the Culture Box uh, network, but, but since we're talking about Godzilla, yeah. I feel like we can't not promote Nathan. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is the world that he lives in uh, over there at Monster Island. So um, check him out again. You guys will learn so much from listening to this podcast. And again, there's a lot of fun stuff that takes place. He does these sketches and everything there. It's great. It's mm-hmm. fantastic. And every every person who goes on this podcast, they have to have a different story about how they got there. Yes. Like I was I was lost on the island you for are. a long while. You were. <laughs> Everybody else was dealing with COVID. And, I was... and Dallas was stuck on the monster island. <laughs> Oh my god. Leaving gosh. me to podcast by myself. Yep. Yeah, that happened. So all right. Well, let's talk about uh some spoil stuff. And we're gonna weave in a couple interesting conversations. Mm-hmm. Um we're um before we even want um was there a specific uh, you had mentioned that one of your favorite parts was the 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 grandeur of Godzilla. Yeah. So what's is there a specific scene about that that was just really like bam? There's several scenes. Mm-hmm. Like anytime his full body was on screen, mm-hmm. he just commanded the scene because mm-hmm. he's such a big boy. Like yeah. he's a big boy. Um Dallas is laughing at my choice of words. <laughs> but and I, but I also appreciate that they didn't show him a lot. Yeah. You know, we talked about this when we did the podcast on the 2014 mm-hmm. Godzilla that I like when they allude mm-hmm. to Godzilla. They talk about him rather than show him constantly, show him constantly because it creates this, this air of mystery. Mm-hmm. Um, I also, I agree with something that our friend Branson said, but we played that yet. Not yet. Not yet. Uh, that they did a good job in this, in making him a force of nature, mm-hmm. you know, and I, and I had said that beforehand when you and I were leaving the theater, that a lot of the legendary and American versions of Godzilla play off more of the later Godzilla movies mm-hmm. where they're a little bit more goofy. Godzilla's the hero. Mm-hmm. Like he's he is a a part of nature, but he is he just wants to chill mm-hmm. and eat fish. Right. Like that's 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 the thing. Whereas this, it was more of a he is a territorial being. Mm-hmm. He is destruction. Yeah. Like you see, remember those old mayhem commercials? Yeah. yeah. Godzilla is <laughs> mayhem. mayhem. Well, you brought up Branson. Let's let's go ahead and go into Branson's clip. Okay. And then uh, we'll come back, and, and I want to talk a little about what Branson talked about. Mm-hmm. Hello, devoted geeks. This is Branson. Uh, popping in for just a quick second. Dallas asked me to record a reaction to the recent release, Godzilla Minus One. So I wanted to jump in and share my thoughts about that movie. Um, First and foremost, let me say that this movie caught me completely off guard. So, cards on the table. I am not a Godzilla enthusiast to the extent that some of our other devoted geeks are. I enjoy uh, a lot of the Godzilla movies. Um, My first exposure to Godzilla was actually, I think, Godzilla vs. Godzilla. Or maybe it was Godzilla versus King Kong, like back from the seventies, the, the the old Japanese movies. And I mean, I had fun. It was it was interesting, but I was never really a big fan of Godzilla to the extent that some other people are. Uh, kind of got into the mythos actually because of my son, Young B. He took an interest to the movies, and so we saw a lot of uh, the Legendary Universe films. Uh, saw all of them actually. We're looking forward to the new one coming out soon. But uh, when they announced that they were doing a remake of the original 1950s production, I mentioned it to my son, and he said, yeah, I'd like to go see that. So we bought the tickets and went. And uh, I walked in with a big tub of popcorn because I expected to see a you know 60-foot lizard tear through a town in Tokyo and people run and scream. And that was the extent of it. So I bought a tub of popcorn, you know, got a bottle of water, was just going to enjoy the movie for what it was. I was not prepared. 
I was not prepared for the emotional ride that this movie was. Um, it's hard to talk about without getting into spoilers. So if you have not yet seen the movie, you might want to pause this now, go watch it, then come back. Okay, have you done that? Great. Okay. The movie starts out with a failed kamikaze pilot. This is a guy who was supposed to fly to his death for the glory of the Japanese Empire and chickened out. Made up some excuse about his plane being broken and flew into a a, a repo place. Or a, a, a equipment depot. And while he's there, Godzilla attacks and... Through his own cowardice, he runs away and ends up being only one of two survivors of that entire base. So this guy has survivor's guilt twice. And then when he gets home, he gets home to Tokyo post-atomic bomb. So everywhere that he knew his home is completely obliterated and destroyed. And it's just this deep, deep emotional journey of seeing his survivor's guilt and the PTSD from his time at war and surviving an attack by Godzilla and the, the, the demons and the struggles that, that he fights. I mean, and and granted this was, we, we saw Godzilla for like a grand total of like three minutes, maybe. And most of the movie is spent looking at the emotional impact that this guy has had from his experiences And when Godzilla shows up again, he has all these, these flashbacks and it it takes him back to a place he doesn't want to be. And just the man, it just, it hits some hard places. It hit some hard places that I was not ready for. But the thing is, it was beautifully done. It it did it in such a way that I actually cared about this character. I cared about the life he was living. I, I, I wanted to see him succeed and and I was upset when I saw him not succeed. And so it is an emotional ride. Uh, I absolutely loved the conversations they had about the value of life and the difference between going into battle to glorify an empire versus going into battle to fight for the hope of a future. And they made that distinction. And I love the fact that they made that distinction. They weren't going out in a blaze of glory because glory to the Japanese empire. They were fighting for the hope of a future. They were fighting for their children. They were fighting in such a way that they wanted to come back home when the fighting was over. And that to me was just such a beautiful picture of the value of life and the importance of life and and not counting anyone's life as expendable or, or something to be tossed or, or, counted cheaply but that every life is is valuable i really appreciated that um i appreciated that godzilla was treated like a force of nature as a matter of fact whenever they refer to godzilla they call him it not he it and i liked that take because it drove home how important the humans were in the story Godzilla wasn't the hero of the story, nor was he really the villain. He was this environmental force that they had to fight. Like, I almost didn't have a sense of of anger or rage coming off of Godzilla. It was like watching a hurricane or, or a tornado or a volcano erupt. It was a force of nature. And it was really interesting to see Godzilla in that light because most of the other films I had seen, Godzilla was, was personified. It was, he needs to come do this. He needs to fight this monster. He's going to do this. He's going to do this. This was the first film I had seen where Godzilla truly was a force of nature, not just the bad guy of the film. And I enjoyed that take on it. Uh, Man, so many other things I could say, but I don't want to be here for forever talking about it if you have not seen it go see it if you're a Godzilla fan of any kind whether you're a casual fan or a diehard fan this movie needs to be on your list so I can't recommend it enough I also want to highly recommend it because I went to see it with my 11 year old son 
And there are so few movies out there that are truly, genuinely family friendly in the sense that you can take your kids to see it, but also they deal with these deep emotional issues that you have to work around. Uh, it was not overly gory. There was a little bit of blood here and there, but it was not overly gory. Uh, language was mild. Uh, very, I don't think there was any sexual references at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the, the couple in the, in the, uh, in the movie, they are unmarried and most of the people kind of fuss at the guy for saying, why haven't you asked her to marry you yet? It's obvious y'all work well together. Why aren't you married? So great family values. Uh, I, I just go see the movie. Just go see the movie. Take my word for it. Go see the movie. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget you are loved. And I don't remember how these things normally wrap up. So I will just say you are loved. You are cared for. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. Thanks for listening. All right. So appreciate Brandon taking the time to, to give us that audio about his experience going in. And I, I love the fact that he got to go with his son, Young B. Yeah. I love that aspect so much. But he brings up a really great point about the emotionalism of it. Oh, yeah. Following a, uh, the main character, he is a, a failed kamikaze. And by failed, we mean that he, um, he pretended like his plane was busted and mm-hmm. he landed and, and to, to, for maintenance. And there, again, it's a, it's a very different culture than we have here. And this was yeah. a running theme throughout the entirety of the thing was, was the sanctity of life. And yeah. they, they had no qualms of saying this in the movie that how, during that time frame, the country's view of their own people was not at all like what we see life with our people. Right. They're, they were sending people literally to die. And there's some conversation. Nathan did a great, in his uh, podcast, he actually wrote a letter from a kamikaze pilot. Mm. And talk, like there was pride and honor of what he was doing, mm-hmm. uh, of going in there to do this. Because in their minds, that this was the only way to protect their country. Yeah. Um, at the same time, though, it's a... It's a it spread into them a low value of of everyone's life needs to be mm-hmm. preserved as best they can, and that was kind of a running theme throughout this whole thing. I was like, we want to make sure everyone survives. Yeah, well, and it also delved into some topics of mental health, mm-hmm. like which Japan struggles with. Mm-hmm. That is a, a well known fact of that. I they don't seek help. Mm-hmm. Um, it's so it's. <sighs> It was good to see because it's almost like maybe the next generation is going, hey, this is kind of messed up mm-hmm. that we're not talking about this, that mm-hmm. we're not dealing with this. Right. And so I think that added to some of the emotionalism mm-hmm. because there were several sections where a dude was having PTSD. Oh, yeah. Like he was having issues. Yeah. Bretson said it great. Like he had PTSD, but also survivor's guilt for two separate events. Yeah. First yeah. surviving the war period, but also what happened at Odo Island. Yeah. And then the fact that he was supposed to die. And so now he feels like, and he's being told mm-hmm. that he's the reason that the country is having the issues it's having. No, mm-hmm. it's not. It's not on this one man's shoulders. Right. But because he came back instead of doing a, a kamikaze thing. Mm-hmm. People have a face to put their hurt and their pain and their blame to. And he happens to be that face. I, I th- that is a great way to put it. They needed a face for the, for the pain, and the hurt. Yeah. And, um, and they, and then like, cause we talked about it is that it's the, the neighbor was really angry mm-hmm. at him. And I felt like when the neighbor was going off on him, I felt bad for both sides. First off, yeah. this is a grieving woman. Who's lost everything? Her her children, her husband probably died in the war. And in her mind, she's thinking that um if and it was a mindset, she said you they died because you didn't do your job. Yeah. Uh, I do want to correct what Branson said in his audio that, that it was the atomic bomb. That the, they weren't a victim of the atomic bomb. It was the victim of uh the the carpet bombing that took place in the area, which is very different because the atomic bomb would happen, there there would be no survivors, period. Right. But this is the carpet bombing. And so she goes, if you had not done, if you had done your job, my family would be here. 
And then immediately afterwards, it was, where's my parents? They're dead. And so now it's, I am responsible for the death of this woman's family. Yeah. And I am responsible for the death of my, fa- of my family. Yeah. And then what's interesting is this beautiful moment right afterwards. After that devastation of I've lost everything, I'm the cause of my family being death. He inadvertently becomes the, um, the father figure of a new family. Mm-hmm. As we have this, this young lady who her herself has lost everything. Mm-hmm. rescues a child who's lost everything. Mm-hmm. And now he's helping to take care of them at the same time, raising up a family together, uh, officially and unofficially at the same time. And yeah. I thought that that was a really interesting aspect of the story to me was this family unit that came together. And then as time goes by, because like I said, this is multi-eared, the neighbor's part of this family. Yeah. She's, t- she, she's, she's hurt, mm-hmm. but now she's moved past this hurt a little bit because they realize... We don't have time to hurt, which is a central aspect of, of Japanese culture even of itself, where they don't have time for their personal stuff. Right. Um, being an island nation, the, and the reason why they're kind of anti everyone being independent is because tsunamis happen, things, devastations happen, earthquakes happen, and when they happen, we have to come together quickly to take care of each other. Right. And that's what took place here is we're devastated, we're hurting, we're grieving. But we're like, we got to take care of each other. They looked at the next generation. They looked at this baby. Mm-hmm. And they said, this baby needs somebody. Yeah. We need to put away our pain, our, our doubts, our differences at the moment. Because this baby needs hope Yeah, for a moment. And she said, the neighbor said something when, the, when Noriko mm-hmm. first brought the baby to the house the mm-hmm. next day. Because the baby was crying, mm-hmm. like babies do, mm-hmm. and she goes, "So you brought home a family, huh?" And he's like, "No, I'm just it's not her baby. She found her. She's taking care of her. And so now I'm helping to take care of both of them." Mm-hmm. And she goes, "That's not her baby." Right. Like it occurred to her that this person has no concept of how to take care of this child. Right. And so she really had to come in and teach them. Mm-hmm. This is how you care for a baby. Mm-hmm. Like, cause, cause Noriko was so young yeah. that she wouldn't have known. Yeah. Like she would have known, Hey, you hand it off to the mom to feed, but like feeding a baby who is used to being breastfed. That's not, like and you don't have bottles Mm -hmm. the bottles were not a thing yet right at least not in japan and so it just the the gravity of going okay well i don't like you but if i don't do something this kid's gonna die yeah and and i love it because it kind of cuts it like the suggestion is she examined the baby made Mm -hmm. sure it was okay realized it needs help Mm -hmm. and then she offers up her own ration of rice yeah not for them but for the baby, mm-hmm. she goes, take this, my ration of rice, make rice milk for the baby. Yeah. And I think that's a, it's a beautiful scene that takes place. And the, the whole concept of everything to, is beautiful to me. And it's something I wish more people understood of. We get so wrapped up in our personal lives that mm-hmm. we forget that there's people who are hurting. Yeah. They need hope. They need someone to go, all right, let's come together. Like let's, this. This lady could have very easily just sat in her wreckage of a house mm-hmm. of what was left and just been depressed, just yeah. been there. Mm-hmm. And she chose not to. Yeah. So crazy stuff. All right. Well, um, let's, let's jump into another audio. Mm-hmm. Our buddy Drew from the Cellcast, which is great. Another, another fantastic uh, podcast that we encourage you guys to check out. Uh, he brought his own thoughts in. So Dallas wants to know my favorite scene from Godzilla minus one. And I can, I'm not sure I can get it into exactly my favorite scene, but I will tell you about the one that sticks with me the most. And that is Godzilla's attack on Ginza, which is a suburb of Tokyo. Uh, throughout this whole movie, of course we've been following Nori, uh, Noriko and uh, Koichi and I was so invested with these characters. I wanted both of them to live. I wanted them both to live happy lives. Them and their adopted daughter, basically, um, Akiko. I w- so when they when, when that when that scene starts, and you're here, and uh, 
Koichi is at home with Akiko, and the news comes on and says that a giant monster is attacking Ginza. And we know that Ginza is where um, Noriko is working. You're, you're merely thinking, oh, dread. That, that, that dread kind of washes over you. And then it shifts to that scene, and we see she's either going to work or coming home. She's riding the train either way. And the uh, another train basically crashes in front of her, causing the train to have to come to a stop. And then uh, she turns around because she can feel the you know the earth shaking, and she says, "Is that Godzilla?" Basically, because she because uh, uh, Koichi had told, kind of told her the story already about what he's what he ran into before. And then the theme, Godzilla theme song comes in in full terrifying glory. Dun, 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 dun. And it's like, I've never been more terrified and excited to see Godzilla on screen at the same time. Because I don't want these characters to die. But yet, this is a Godzilla film. Part of the reason you go to a Godzilla film is to see Godzilla destroy stuff. That's just how it works. And I, but I don't want the characters to die. But I want to see Godzilla, you know, do stuff and destroy stuff. So, the uh they're she's they're running from Godzilla. Eventually Koichi apparently catches up to her before Godzilla's uh had too much time, and they are he, and they are running together down this street. Bear in mind he was in like another part of Tokyo, so I don't know how he got there so fast. But they're running down the street, and then they hear the tanks fire at Godzilla, and everyone on the street turns around and sees you know the smoke and th- and someone even says, Did they get him? And then the smoke clears. And no, they didn't get him. He's Godzilla. This is halfway through the film. There's no way he's dead right now. And then uh, he starts charging the atomic breath. The, 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 his fins are turn- on, the, on his back are turning blue and they're sticking out like, like a toy getting ready to charge. And then he fires this atomic breath straight, I'm assuming right at the tanks, which look like they were on the Capitol building there in uh, Tokyo. And this huge attack goes off and the shockwave is coming towards them. And just before it hits, she, uh, Noriko pushes Koichi into this alleyway. So he'll be safe, but she gets hit by the shockwave and gets thrown back. And we do not see her. I'm not going to say we don't see her again, but we, uh, as far as we know, she's gone. And as, as he is trying to, as he's walking out, looking for and trying to come to terms with the fact and not believing that she is dead. At one point he turns around and Godzilla is there. And this is like the money shot of the film. Go, he's staring at this huge mushroom cloud caused by his atomic breath. And it's almost like he's proud of it. Like a cat, uh, throw, a. Uh, having having caught a mouse and it's coming to show it to you it's that kind of a it feels like it's that kind of a look it's like that's what i did that and it's such a devastating moment and you're wondering is this like all this movie is is this going to be like uh, dark and nihilistic and disturbing and it's not i will tell you it, there is hope at the end of this film you need it, you need to see it for the hope at the end uh, yeah, go see it while it's still in theaters, and if you uh, and if you miss it, then get it on home video. It is that good. My favorite part of Drew's comment mm-hmm. is that Godzilla looked like a cat. <laughs> I mean, he's not wrong though. It's like, look what I did. <laughs> either, either that, but I felt more like, like again, sticking with Drew's cat analogy. It was mm-hmm. not a look what I did. It was a what come at me. Yeah, exactly. Like I did that. <laughs> what you gonna say? Oh my gosh! Uh, I'm with Drew. That scene was so interesting. The way that they did the fire, the the fire breath, the atomic breath ah, scene. So good. I, I love how like every time there's a Godzilla film, there's a different way of doing it. Mm-hmm. And this was fascinating. I loved the way that the spikes popped up. Mm-hmm. Like, like it was a toy. Mm-hmm. Like he's like, I'm charging up. Oh, oh, oh. The, and then the, they slam down as he just yeah, yeah yeah it's like he was like gathering all his mm-hmm. radiation mm-hmm. into his stomach right and it was popping out his back and then he was like <laughs> okay and go right it was it was impressive it was it pretty really cool to was. see 
Um, but that scene itself, um, they were talking about like the whole thing where where Noriko just disappears. Yeah. I I stopped. I I, I saw it, I saw the blast coming. I was like, and I, I for a moment I was like, they're gonna jump into. The, I thought he was gonna pull her in. Yeah. But he's frozen, and she goes, poof. She saves him. Yeah. And then she's gone. Which honestly adds to his issues. Yeah. Like his mental health issues because then he has survivor's guilt for a third thing. Mm -hmm. And he thinks that it's the spirits of the dead people from Odo Island not Mm -hmm. letting him be happy. Yeah. Because he had just gotten to the point of where he was like, I... I can be a part of this family. Yeah. Again, I can I can live. Mhm. And then this happens. Yeah. The I think this that it was really well encapsulated in the scene where he realizes what's happened. Mm-hmm. He he gets over the shock, he stands up. He's looking for Noriko and Godzilla's walking away and Godzilla roars. Mhm. And he has just realized that the woman he loves but didn't feel like he could be with, had any right to be with, Mm -hmm. is gone. Yeah. And he screams Mm. back at Godzilla. And I'm like, that is so much rage, Mm -hmm. so much hurt, Mm. and so much pain just coming out of this man. Yeah. And, And for him... Godzilla was the face of all of that. Oh, yeah. Now, admittedly, big giant lizard walking on <laughs> land. That's going to be pretty traumatic. Oh, yeah. But it's the it was the compounding of everything mm-hmm. that you're like, this guy just can't get a break. He was broken. That was the breaking point for him. That was the final yeah. star. Was again, he, he thinks he can rebuild. And then it's just wiped away again. Loses everything. As as the ashes of everything comes falling down from the sky, it was just, it was heartbreaking to watch. I literally like I stopped, like my hands were in the air, like what just happened? Yeah, like I was in shock at that moment. We had a group of what four or five guys yeah. sitting in front of us, and they're younger guys, and they stopped mm-hmm. because and this is something else we were talking about mm-hmm. the the way they utilized sound mm-hmm. and silence in this movie oh my gosh. was so good mm-hmm. because you would have these scenes where everything is loud there's things happening Godzilla's roaring people are screaming buildings are falling to the ground and then there would just be nothing yeah and it was great because it gave you a chance to sit with the gravity mm-hmm. of what had just happened yeah yeah, absolutely. It was the sound design was fantastic throughout the entirety of it. As they they built these moments up and then they stopped it. Mm-hmm. Um, one of those moments takes place in what Nathan's about to tell us to talk about here in a second mm. at the end of the film, and that was a part where it really struck oh, me. Oh yeah. So let's let's jump into Nathan. Uh, Nathan again. This is Nathan Marchin from Monster Island Film Vault. Um, you guys will get a little feel for for his show in this next audio clip. We interrupt this podcast live from Ogasawara. It's the Monster Island Film Vault, and I am Nate Marchand, the host of said podcast and Monster Island's film curator. And that's Jimmy from NASA, my intrepid producer. Yes, I'm getting to the point. So, Godzilla Minus One. It's hard to pick a favorite scene, for me anyway, Because the whole dang movie is just absolutely incredible. I might still be in the honeymoon phase right now, but I'm thinking Mount Rushmore of kaiju films status here. We'll see how I feel about it in, I don't know, six months or so. But if you had to twist my arm, yes, I know you did that just before we started. Oh, my gosh. All right. All right. I would have to go with the scene where Shikishima flies his plane into Godzilla's mouth. Everything in that scene is 
firing on all cylinders, all of the drama and the buildup with his story involving Akiko and the mission and the plane and the supposed death of Noriko. Spoiler warning. (laughs) Everything built up to that in this one last desperate moment when Godzilla is about to literally nuke everybody and he goes through seemingly with his plan and then everything goes silent. Every time I see this in a movie theater, because I've seen it twice so far, you could hear a pin drop. And then that silence goes on for a heck of a lot longer than I would have expected. And it lets that tension build. It is a perfect example of how silence can be louder than noise. It is is incredible and i will admit even though i thought i knew how it was going to end i teetered a little bit i really did wonder is he actually going to go through with this are we going to end on a bit of a tragedy and then to my surprise he doesn't he ejects and oh the cathartic release that i have with that he chose life he chose to live even though he said i wasn't supposed to just cinematic perfection. Oh, sorry, not sorry, Jimmy. We're out of time. We'll have to talk about your favorite scene in the next episode. Maybe. All right. And so that was Nathan. Appreciate you, Nathan. <laughs> and we appreciate uh, Jimmy from NASA also. Well, hopefully yeah. we can hear from Jimmy sometime in the future. Uh, <laughs> but anyways... That whole scene at the end, that was the scene I was talking about, that they do the best part of it, of the silence. Well, and then there was another part later mm-hmm. that they also did a fantastic job with mm. that makes me go, they're setting things up. Mm-hmm. But just the, go go ahead and talk about. Oh, yeah. Well, it's just the, again, you, you have this like, just emotionalness of like you know the the kid that they left behind because they're like look we want you to survive we leave the future to you 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 have experienced war we're trying to help save Mm -hmm. you from this mess the kid shows up with a fleet of tugboats because again the whole point was they were going to try to kill godzilla by sinking him rapidly sinking him and because that didn't work try to do a rapid decompression and they're trying to pull him up quickly but they couldn't so the tugboats came they're helping to pull godzilla as fast as they can and uh, of course, it doesn't work. And so there's this chaos. And now he's charging his atomic breath. And then here comes our main character. And the entire time, is like he, his mindset, though, they've been setting you up going, I'm going to kill myself. And they're telling him, don't do it. Yeah. You've got it. And he's like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to. Because in his mind, he's like, I have to do this because this is what the spirits want. They're mad at me for surviving. I'm going to finish the job. I'm mm-hmm. going to save people. And he flies in there, but and I called it, I, and I was so happy I called it because there's a scene where the the only other survivor from Odo Island, who is mad as I'll get out at him, happens to go, "Hey, look, there's an injection seat here. Mm-hmm. Pull it. Don't." He goes, "Live, yeah, live in this moment. Don't let this take you." I'm adding to the vocabulary here, yeah, yeah. but. That was such a big ordeal. Again, this was part of that whole, he realizes the sanctity of life. And this is so key. Don't throw your self life away. Because we need you to. And so he flies into Godzilla's mouth. But before he does, the, you see the panic and the fear, but it's complete silence. Like you feel the, the drama. You feel the terror. You feel the, the anticipation of, uh, and, and almost like the dread of like, we felt we've done all we can and it wasn't enough and then all of a sudden you just hear the engines of the plane of koichi flying in and you're like like that that the engine like just that after that moment of science where you allowed yourself to feel the terror of everybody else the engines almost feel like hope Mm -hmm. engines of hope just flying into god's mouth and I caught, I saw him pull the ejection seat. I saw oh, him fly did you? Yeah, I saw it was like I a super it. split. 
I missed fly it. off. And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> flies out of there and and because especially when you look at the scenes just before and this is the catch where it got me was the because he leaves the baby behind yeah and uh with a note so, and money saying please take care of my baby to, mm-hmm. to the neighbor and he's like here take care of her take care and she's taking her right before the the operation takes off she gets a telegram mm-hmm. and i called her, i was like oh she's and sure enough, uh, Noriko was alive. She was okay. And I was like, yes. I really thought that she was going to be alive and then he was going to kamikaze. Mm. And then she was going to be left alone. No, oh, man. Oh, but it was so good that, that he used the ejection sheet seat. He mm-hmm. chose to live. Yeah. And that was the whole thing was, again, that was... That's the driving force behind this whole, for me, and I feel like that it was often said, we need each, we all need to live. We need yeah. to fight to live. We need to put things aside and, and fight to be part of it. And then that was again, the driving force was, they said several times, our country doesn't care about us. We need to care for ourselves. Well, and you also had... At one of the points when he was having a PTSD issue where he was going, is this real oh, or yeah. are you a dream? Mm-hmm. And he goes, I was supposed to die and I'm here. Yeah. And Noriko goes, no one who survived the war was not supposed to survive. Yeah. Like, and you see that because if he had kamikaze, then there would not have been anyone who had the piloting skills. Yeah. Yeah. To do you what said that wrong. Everyone who survived the war was meant to survive. Yeah. Yeah. The way you said that was saying that everyone who survived was not supposed to survive. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not what I meant. <laughs> yeah. But you're right. And that, that line was so good. It, it reminds me of our friends um, over at the Orphan's Hands. Yeah. Which is a, yeah. a fantastic organization. We we'll encourage you guys to check out a few. Um, they, it's an orphanage that's in the Ukraine. I'm sorry, in Moldova. And, um, they started many years ago, but they, they, what's crazy, what's great about this particular organization, which by the way, shout out to them because that they helped us to fund our computer a couple of years ago. They did. But, um, they have a thing that they've taught their, the kids there mm-hmm. and they've been going for so long that kids that they've rescued off the streets now serve and now help run the orphanage themselves. Yeah. And it, it's a healthy, it's a safe environment. It's not like what, it's not like some of the horror scenes you hear about. They are very meticulous about caring for these kids. And in this area, they're one of the few that keep kids up to adult age. Because in most of those orphanages over there, by like age 15, you're given 20 bucks and then a bus ticket and said, survive. And yeah. s- sadly, some don't. But they have this phraseology that they drill into the kids. And that's simply this. If you were born, you have a purpose. And that's really what Norco says. If you're living, you have a purpose. If you're here right now, there's a reason for it. Do not give up in this moment. Yeah. And that was, again, that was one of the things that caught me with the story so much was this importance on life. And it was just beautiful. Yeah, it was. It was absolutely. The storytelling was fantastic. Mm-hmm. It dealt with the beauty of life, but it also dealt with the hard things, the things that that are more difficult and there is this because you had both sides of things the horrors the the rebuilding the the terror the Mm -hmm. all of that but you also had the simple things of watching um i I think her name was akiko the -hmm. the baby learning to draw and helping noriko cook and Mm -hmm. just the the small things that give hope yeah in everyday life yeah that it was such a beautifully complex story because it did have both things. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, so is there anything else you want to add to this conversation? I think I am good. Oh, man. Well, needless to say, when this movie drops on DVD, I will be purchasing it. Yeah. Or Blu-ray, rather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because physical media is important. It is, <laughs> as, as we have learned in recent time frame. Yes. 
All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's our conversation for today. We want to hear from you. Have you watched Godzilla Minus One? What was your favorite part? Leave a comment and let us know. If you haven't watched it, they, some areas have extended the show times. Uh, if, I encourage you to go check it out if you can. It is worth seeing in theaters. It really is. Um, it will be definitely worth getting on Blu-ray. I am curious to see if the Blu-ray will have a dubbing option. Because I know some people just can't handle subtitles. Right. But it's worth watching. And if, if they don't have, have a dubbing for it, it, it's worth stretching yourself a little bit to watch the subtitles. Mm-hmm. Because it's such a beautiful story. Um, I like what Nathan said. He's kind of in the, in the honeymoon phase. And so we'll see how he feels about it in six months. About if, how, where it lands in his favorite Godzilla movies. Mm. That's a, I, I think it's a great way of putting it, especially when you're someone so close to the property. Yeah. Uh, but it is up there for me right now. It's one of my favorite Godzilla films of I, all time. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna not say where it is in my favorites, but it is so good. It, all right, real quick, just, just curious, does it beat out Ferris Bueller and the Really Big Lizard? It might. <laughs> it might. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Well, Celeste, why don't you land this plane? Okay. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to Calm Talk today. If you have loved this episode, head on over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify to rate and leave a review. It is very much appreciated. So until next time, stay devoted. Peace and love. Peace and love.